Okay, starting. Trying no ums and uhs. Okay, welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about chaos theory. And uh, we, I mean, depending on what, what you guys would like to insert, I, I've put a bunch of stuff on here that we can talk about mostly that will help with, or not exactly help with, but just sort of give little pointers to things that you probably have to dig into more deeply if you want to really understand. But, and I myself, am uh, uh, just about barely capable of talking about this stuff in um, any kind of detail. But uh, so it's like, explore this together and jump in whenever you feel like you want something to be explored. And and I'm very glad that Ryan's here. He probably knows a lot more about this stuff than I do. So please uh, feel free to jump in with comments, clarifications. All right. Um, so let me correct that number. It's number 12, I believe, today. Uh, so I thought right at the beginning to make a somewhat philosophical point <clears throat> uh, which we sort of all have been bringing up over and over again, but now is a good time to make clear the distinction between the model and the thing that we're talking about. Because even fairly expert scientists will often jump around and muddle in this zone. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard this line that the map is not the territory. You, you may not know the source, it's this um, Alfred Korzybski. And uh, I like how he points out that similar structure is important for a map or isomorphism or approximate isomorphism as the more technical language. But, uh, and, and I'm sure a lot of you have also seen this like one paragraph Borges story, which I just love even the language of it. There's an empire, that was obsessed with map making in those in time those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied and the cartographers guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it the following generations who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been saw that that vast map was useless and not without some pitiless, pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. Uh, in the deserts of the West, still today, there are tattered ruins of that map. <laughs> so it's quite an image. But yeah, I think everybody gets the idea that a map needs to be simpler than the thing that it represents. But this can get muddled when people think that it is possible for a scientific theory to have some sort of one-to-one -one correspondence with all phenomena. And particularly if you're the sort of person who likes the idea that, you know, the universe is a program or something like that. Uh, so I am not one of those people. I, I always like to point out that the model is something and the thing that is being modeled is something else. But my favorite metaphor for that actually comes from Buddhism rather than this map territory thing. Uh, I, the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon itself. And this is something that I think I first encountered via Himanshu, who used to keep saying it in grad school. Um, but what I like about it is that unlike a map, a finger is, does not have to be isomorphic with the moon. I mean, it, it, and it isn't. So at, I, at, on the one hand, you have things that clearly look like the thing that you're drawing attention to, or your attention or someone else's attention. And then you have things that are, that are not much like the thing at all, but still are useful for interacting with some part of the system. So you, even though it, it's not fair to say that, that models have no resemblance to reality. What they do um, is often in the way that they're set up and the way they're framed and the way they're presented, uh, preferentially draw attention to some parts of the phenomenon and ignore others. This is always going to be the case with a, with a model. Um, so the reason I, I thought about this particularly in the context of chaos is the question of whether some natural phenomenon is chaotic or not has come up. It's less fashionable than it was in the 80s and 90s. But to some extent, asking whether the brain is chaotic is, uh, it's like missing a few steps in, in what that sentence means. Um, so, so when the model is not very accurate, we tend to recognize that, yes, this is just a model. Does anyone know what that is? The uh, cuneiform object. 
It's one of the earliest world maps uh, from ancient Sumer or Babylon, I think. Uh, on the right is something you, we all saw not too long ago. I forget which is which, but I, I believe the one on the top, oh wait, the one on the bottom is the Hodgkin Huxley model and top is the data. But the point of that was that when, when things get really, really accurate, even for if it's for just some cherry picked data or carefully constructed data, you tend to start using the model as a mnemonic for the, for the phenomenon. And, and they start to become synonymous with each other. It's almost unavoidable. And in, in, when the models are sophisticated, it's hard to even talk about the phenomenon without sort of interchangeably going between the name of the thing and the name of the model. So uh, with that kind of preamble, would anyone like to dive in and uh, offer a definition or what they think chaos is, what they've heard? I'd say chaos is sensitivity to initial conditions in that any difference in two trajectories gets amplified as you progress in time. So, uh, yes, that the, I, I think that it's very important to um, kind of make clear that these systems are deterministic. And when we say that mm -hmm. uh, something is chaotic, we mean that there was a model constructed and that model was deterministic and sensitive to initial conditions. But the uh, idea of sensitivity to initial conditions, I think now people, because chaos is so in the popular culture, people get it. That small changes could have uh, big impacts, but it's not always uh, the right way to think about it because for those of you who know about strange attractors, this, this it's not some sort of unbound uh, phenomenon where things can just keep going and blowing up or something like that. Yeah, it tends uh, to grow for an intermediate time. And then you'll typically have these oscillating like recurrence. Exactly. Uh, sections. We, can't, we, we can't simply say it's sensitivity to initial conditions, right? For example, you could just have an iterating map of just e to the x. Very, very small values of x that you begin with are going to diverge dramatically. So it's not simply just... Yeah sensitivity to initial conditions. You have to say that if the sensitivity to initial conditions and the space is always bounded where it is going to be, it's not going to explode off into infinity because if that's the case, then every exponential process is chaotic. Right, but yeah, so there's a topological way, I guess you could talk about that, but we can. Um, so yeah, we, I, I, I didn't really put like a full on definition of strange attractor in here, but it's sort of implied in some of what, what we talk about. Would, would anyone like to define what a strange attractor is or what they think it is, what, what they've heard? To me, a strange attractor is some kind of behavior that doesn't repeat in the same trajectory, but kind of like goes around some point over and over again without repeating pretty much and 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 since we've been talking about continuous systems we saw that uh, in, in 2d when you have a, a, an attracting space which, which is dissipated meaning it loses energy you have the situation where you you can have a, an attractor or you could have a limit cycle and that's all you can really have in those kinds of systems but if you just if you think about how trajectories work in 3D, it, um, you could still have something that's attractive overall. Then once you get, enter a certain zone, you can have paths that that stay within that zone and don't cross each other. Um, and and uh, it's sort of a consequence of something that 3D allows that 2D doesn't. That uh, is worth kind of thinking through. Uh, if you imagine what's prevented in a trajectory in 2D versus basically going around <laughs> is, is always possible in dimensions higher than two. Do, do people talk about predictability in terms of like with exponential growth, you don't have to go all the in-between steps. You could just say after a thousand years, we'll be at this much. But with a chaotic system or a strange attractor, my understanding is that you have to know all the in-between steps 
to get there. Otherwise, it's unpredict unpredictable. You won't be able to say after a thousand steps, you'll be here without doing those thousand steps in between. Is that right? It's sort of what Kartik's point is that with, with an exponential, uh, if you don't know the initial conditions exactly, the, there's, a, there's a point uh, sufficient uh, at, at which the uh, numbers that you're calculating for those two different values will be quite different. Um, so it gets right, guaranteed time. Need, but with an exponential, you don't need the in-between. You can just use the formula and then say right. at a thousand years, at, you don't need to know nine, 999 years, but with a chaotic system, do you need to know the in-between steps to, to be able to say where you'll be after a thousand? Uh, not necessarily, but it can be even much, much worse than that. Uh, you can, let's say that for the same example that you gave for the exponential, you don't need to know everything. For the chaotic system, you might just land up on the point exactly when it starts, when it has actually come back close to one another and starts to diverge again, in which case it might look as if it is almost periodic when it's actually not periodic. So you will again get into even bigger issues. So it can get even more complicated than that. In fact, uh, no matter how much finite data you have, uh, if it is a chaotic system, eventually uh, th th things will diverge if you have even a slight um, limitation to how, to how carefully you calculated the, uh, the values. So, it's always like even more <laughs> badly behaved than one might think. So uh, this is something that maybe people who are not super into the math might not be fully aware of, but even though there's all this badly behaved sort of hard to predict stuff going on, there's also something called universality, which is these invariants that show up uh, all over the place in seemingly unrelated um, systems, which will, and if we have time, we'll briefly get to that, or we can talk about it till next time. Um, again, this is something that is really fascinating and I encourage you to like have a look at this, which is the idea that there's things in the state space such as the basins of attraction that become stretched and folded. And you may have seen some diagrams uh, and wondered what they are. And it looks a little bit like colored dough being stretched and folded. And uh, when a bifurcation into chaos occurs, you, you see this in the state space. I still am trying to wrap my head around uh, this and get some get a kind of feeling for it, but I feel I think most people don't actually have that much of a feeling for it. Uh, and sort of related to that, we, we mentioned earlier that there's there's some connection to fractals, uh, which probably won't have time to get into. And unpredictability, I've put last uh, in the sense that uh, that in in practice, yes, you can't predict, but knowing that they're deterministic is kind of important, and because uh, chaos is not randomness, and, and it's good to, to maintain a separation between these two ideas. So, would anyone like to define randomness? So if we start with a different definition of chaos, that is, I think of it as choices. If you have zero choice, then starting from a st state A, you will always just go straight to state B under a stim stimulus force or under a dis disturbance. But if the system has infinite possibilities, then the, the state B it ends up is, is what we are calling random. Whereas in a dynamic process, there are multiple other possibilities happen. So it, yeah, I think of chaos as really a choices in a dynamic system. The word chaos, unfortunately, I think it got really misused and people think of it as random behavior. They, they think of it more like random rather than finite number of possibilities, which I'm calling as choices. That's my definition. But why, is, why should it be finite? Now, at any given, it, it, does, it, does, it can go from zero to infinity, right? But no. In fact, that's the wrong way to think about it, right? If it's, it shouldn't, you don't want it to go to infinity. You're not studying systems which are going to infinity. Yeah. By, by definition, yeah. we are fully not interested in systems that go into infinity. If you're the attractive part so what, what, why are you limiting it? If you look at the practice. Well, it's just the strict definition of, of the very strict how definition we understand of topology. These, uh, if you don't have 
chaotic have boundedness in your interval then what are you actually going through yeah. so there's the, even choice is actually a, there's a problem here because choice also kind of relates more to randomness than to chaos so 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 randomness yeah. uh, is is uh, th- there's a mathematical de- definition that only really kind of came out in the 20th century from kolmogorov and not everybody necessarily knows has heard, has heard it but does it are, are people familiar with um, algorithmic complexity does randomness complexity have areas. have something to do with lack of compressibility is yes. that what you're going for so so that's one of the definitions of randomness there are two others that uh, are are important and as in someone i forget who but after per martin, martin law they proved that these three notions of randomness are all equivalent so one of them is incompressibility meaning that there is uh, no algorithm shorter than the length of the actual sequence of numbers that uh, can be can be used to produce those numbers so so it's like saying that you might as well just wait and see because there's nothing better you can do to predict the next number then another notion has to do with unbiasedness there's another one about martingales but all of them had some there was a proof showing that they're all equivalent but um the most important uh, thing is that it is a subjective uh definition meaning that it depends on the existence of whatever algorithms you happen to have so something that may appear um algorithmically incompressible now if if someone happens to come up with an algorithm for that sequence of numbers um then that's no longer random and uh, so when people sometimes ask is randomness a real part of the universe it's sort of an uh paradoxical or unanswerable question because by definition randomness is what we don't have any ability to compress There's no other kind of randomness so you can't say is randomness actually a force in the universe is a meaningless concept but I, I, then are you saying randomness is infinite well it depends on what you're counting but infinite states the states of what of the system well, some uh, you're defining system with a set of parameters and from the current state when it moves to next state either due to perturbation in in the displacement or in the force it is going to go to a new state but if the new state has innumerable possibilities i am saying that is randomness well chaos so satisfies i don't think you should count so, I, I, you should i don't think it's it's helpful to use possibilities to talk about um randomness except unless you're talking about uh a stochastic process meaning that yeah stochastic uh, that is I, I, but see, but but there is no stochastic process in a chaotic system so which is why choice is 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 not a very useful concept so, there so, so there are two, so yeah, when you are defining a distribution you are limiting it to a continuous system right no no one is a discrete, discrete system, system the even in the discrete system there are two issues here one uh no one saying you are going from zero to infinity in any bounded interval you can have infinite values that you can take and you have you have no way to uh, conclude that a chaotic system will only take a finite set of values in that in fact uh, the the chaotic systems that are typically shown actually span the entire uh, the interval that you want to look at one so choice is a very 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 uh, problematic word here choice means you already have an underlying distribution how are you going to account for an underlying distribution when you already start with a system which has functions functions are not the same as distributions you can not include the word choice you have to say what distribution from which you're going to pick it from so you, you, if you don't have an underlying distribution then it is not deterministic right no 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 you're confusing a function with the distribution that is not the same thing so i think what karthik so i think the best way to to to, to say it is that the the, the uh, concept of choice presupposes randomness or conversely randomness presupposes choice i think that's the better way to think about it because it, the idea is that for whatever reason you cannot restrict what the system is doing and say that is definitely going to do this it's it, for all uh intents and purposes it's as if the system pulled out a number out of a hat and had, and the best we can do is characterize what else is in that hat and that's what we mean when we say that something is stochastic it's that um the behavior appears and we can actually characterize quite well with means and variances and things like that in the shape of this distribution 
what uh, it, what seems to have been pulled up. So when you talk about the unpredictability involved in choice, that's related to this pulling out of a hat in an unbiased way. Whereas the unpredictability related to chaos has to do with small changes in initial conditions. And practically what that means is that if you don't know the initial conditions exactly, you can't predict it. But the person running the system by running it with the exact same initial conditions, each time it's a completely deterministic system. So that, that's why I sort of brought that up to just to maintain this. Because just today actually with someone, I was, there was a confusion about what the difference between chaos and randomness is. So it's good to keep it separate. What, what but you can then add noise in a chaotic system. Would it, would it be helpful to think of it as a sequence? Like with chaos, every step in the sequence, if you, if you know where you are, the next step is really easily predictable. Whereas with a random um, sequence, knowing where you are doesn't help you get to the next step at all. So it's like you, with a random, you, you're totally unpredictable to the next step. And chaos, you know exactly what the next step is going to be. You just don't know a thousand steps later what it, where you're going to be necessarily without going in between. Uh, yeah, that's, only, that's, that's only true if you know the system, right? So Exactly. That's what I was going to say. You have to know. If I were not given the, the equations for the chaotic system and in the same, same way that I don't know what is the distribution from which I'm picking my data out of you know, whatever random process, uh, they would look equally arbitrarily uh, random in both cases. There is no easy way test. There is no easy test to directly distinguish between the chaos system looking random and the random system producing a random outcome. Uh, <laughs> Which is why pseudo random so, number I, generators are often chaotic uh, systems so, because their statistical properties, if you don't know what the seed is, are indistinguishable from randomness. But if you do know the seed, everything gets everything is broken. So, so if, if you take Maxwell's equation, if, when you write B equals mu H, the permeability, if you assume it is constant, then it is a very straightforward to predict uh, uh, B from H or H from B. But you get into certain types of uh, uh, magnetic material with magnet restriction where the mu becomes, uh, uh, it can take a lot of different values within a given magnetic structure. So that's the kind of things I worked on in magnetic recording heads. So if we change this one parameter called magnet restriction, then if, if given shaped structure, it can either have behave like a single domain and all the flux would just pass and come through, or it, it can get stuck into a lot of multiple domain walls. And as we keep increasing the section, so many domain walls form, then we call it serpentine domain. And you, there is no way to predict how it is going to behave. So key point, what Karthik made that material property, that is, if you assume you know what the system is and you can characterize the permeability or elastic uh, uh, modulus of elasticity or any kind of material property, then it is, you know, you know what you, uh, how to model it. But uh, in most of the uh, uh, real life situations, the material property is not really predictable, especially in a structure with defects. And that's where I'm saying this, when I say choice, I'm talking more like a psychology type of thing very have like, multiple like, options then, but this is exactly why i brought up the map territory thing because <laughs> here is and why it's important in the case of chaos and randomness you have to be really really strict about what you're attributing chaos to you should not be attributing chaos to magnets and things like that no no it, it is the a, constitutive it is a, it is a relationship in the system fundamental a, parameter of the system which is why i'm saying what is the system is the system the model or the thing from which you're collecting data. The thing from which you're collecting data, yeah, I think it's inappropriate to call it chaotic. Um, because in the real world, there are always stochastic factors also. You can say that the chaotic model is really, really um, well verified uh, under certain assumptions, but it's, it's for this, <laughs> this reason that I brought that up, that chaos is uh, like where it comes from is, is modeled. And from there, you generalize and say, well, it, this is uh, under these assumptions, such and such data generating thing in the physical world uh, appears to be chaotic. If you wanted to verify that your system was chaotic, you would have to be able to set up 
two exact replicas, change one of them very slightly, and see that the behaviors diverge. You're not going to be able to do that unless you have infinite control on the system, unless you can be totally precise, you know? Exactly. But that, that, that's, a, that's what I was saying. The permeability can be slightly changed and you'll end up with different trajectories. That sounds so, like so, chaos. Yeah. So, so, so those are <laughs> that the, is, the that is that real that... magnetic, magnetic parameters. Right. So, that, so the real system, because it yes. is subject to every kind of uh, stochastic uh, process, thermal noise and quantum fluctuations, um, we cannot defects, right? uh, yeah. say that, or defects also, we cannot yeah. uh, definitively say that, I mean, there are some, re some sort of circumstantial evidence that might, that people will use, but it's all fairly sort of up in the air and still open research at the moment. But there are tests to say, I think my system is is chaotic. We we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. One one way I I like to like think of the differences between chaotic systems and probabilistic systems is mainly as a as a model builder. What my expectation is usually when I'm building a probabilistic model of something, the expectation is even though I may not, there may be variability in my say for example knowing of say the condition or state of a specific part of the system at any point that I can within, again, some variability predicates uh, state later on, right? That it's within some parameterized distribution in some cases, if you think of a parameterized model. And that's the expectation. Um, but when modeling a chaotic system, the expectation is that uh, the, the future states are unpredictable, right? I, that I'm not gonna be surprised if uh, the states end up where I do not expect them to be, which I would be otherwise surprised if I'm doing a probabilistic model, right? I may not know the exact um, state it will end up at, but it will be characterized by some distribution. One thing, thing that makes this tricky is that there are statistical invariants in chaotic systems. And this is why I, Paul, I started with something that is an apparently philosophical point. If we don't make sure we're very careful here, it'll all seem very muddled. So chaotic systems can be studied statistically. And then you'll find that regions of the state space, in, in the case of the Lorenz attractor, for instance, they'll show the exact same statistical histograms of, of occupancy. It's quite amazing. Um, so that's why right here is the time to make clear where the stochasticity comes when we are analyzing a chaotic system statistically. It's really important that that's clear because otherwise it'll just be like mixing the two concepts. So, so chaotic mixing. Some of some, so some of, of of us are old enough to be. We were on the edge of the time when chaos was really, really kind of uh, sexy in the pop science world. And I think by the time we got to grad, at least when I got to grad school in 2006, I think by that time already chaos theory was sort of um, drifting away from the public consciousness. It's really interesting. It sort of blew up in the 80s and then uh, there was some awareness of it and people wanted to say everything in the world, life consciousness, everything is chaotic. And then it's sort of, now it's just one of those things that, that is in the background. But at the time when people started to realize that deterministic systems could be chaotic. The reason it was such a, a, um, a sort of threat to the old worldview was because of um, something that people attribute to Laplace, which might not actually be accurate, but um, he painted this Im image of a creature, which knowing all the forces and all the uh, initial conditions and had the capacity to calculate all the data uh, would have no uncertainty. And people call this Laplace's demon and the Laplacian dream, uh, but this I just discovered this in Wikipedia. Uh, as it turns out in various places, including the famous book by James James Gleick, um, the quote, the quote uh, would have done uh, been better with a little bit more uh, of, the, of the context around it. Um, because Laplace was aware that that imaginary creature is something that we aspire to, but we will always remain infinitely removed from it. So for whatever reason, some sort of game of telephone was going on during the 1800s. And um, people started to think that all we need is enough uh, computational power 
and careful observation and everything will seem perfectly clockwork like and the and all this may be a sort of caricature but it it's one that became quite powerful over the course of the 19th and then the 20th century um so in this paper i sent out you you have you know there's no citation here right but then there's this once upon a time kind of thing for a long time it was thought that the fate of a deterministic system is predictable um, and that these designations were two names of the same thing. This equivalence arose from a mathematical truth. Deterministic systems are specified by differential equations that make no reference to chance. Um, but as it turns out, uh, small errors will have major consequences in these kinds of systems. So I like jumping into the history, but in this case, there's, there's I, it's not a very deep, but I, I think a lot of people uh, start with Lorenz and then stuff that happened in the 60s and 70s. But the right place to start is uh, Henri Poincaré again, who re he just keeps coming up uh, wherever I look nowadays in mathematical topics. And he was um, working on the three body problem, but I think people, uh, which is much, much harder than the two body problem. And just to remind everyone that in uh, Newtonian, physics of the sort that people are using for celestial me me mechanics, they were using conservative systems, meaning systems in which the um, energy is constant. What that means is that when you, when you see some sort of orbit, it's not stable. It, uh, it, it can be bumped off and then you'll be in, an, in a new, it, it'll be, it's like a, what, what were they called? So, so called nodes or something like that. So, uh, but even in those kinds of systems, you have this sensitive dependence on initial conditions where you can get vastly different orbits. But these types of systems don't uh, conform to what Karthik was talking about and what we're talking about, which is this staying constrained to a particular part of the state space. Because conservative systems uh, don't have this attractive property. And it's a little bit confusing because some people I've seen uh, people describing conservative systems using the gravity metaphor, which is quite unfortunate <laughs> because a gravitational system as normally treated is a conservative system. So thinking of an attractor as a planetary attraction is not a very helpful metaphor. So the three body problem as it, uh, Poincare initially, oh yeah. So, the, so apparently he won a prize offered by the King of Sweden uh, where he solved or claimed to have solved the uh, three-body problem showing some kind of stability. But then he himself realized that he made a mistake <laughs> and that, 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 that what he had done was wrong. And he, and he uh, set up uh, a perspective on, on differential equations that became quite important. So people who followed him include uh, Jacques Hadamard, who um, people call this Hadamard's billiard, but it's basically something that I think is pretty intuitive, which is that in situations like this, where you have that red uh, marker in the middle, small differences in the angle at which you hit that will have uh, major consequences for where the system will end up. But again, these are conservative systems and uh, systems where you have these kinds of bumps in some kind of bowl will also be really, really sensitive. Uh, so, by as we, as we saw with the uh, Van der Paul story, around the time electronics was coming in, and people started to get interested in dissipative systems, uh, partly because those kinds of systems are dissipative. And, and also, if you want stable oscillations for the purpose of radio, you need stability. So you need attractors. And uh, I found this interesting paper on uh, women in chaos theory. And they uh, the one thing that they ask is, well, why was this? not so well known, sort of 20 years before chaos became big, there were a couple of people uh, who basically sowed the seeds for this. One was this um, Russian scientist, Sofia Kovalevskaya, and the other person we'll talk about a little, uh, Mary Cartwright. So, so uh, Freeman Dyson was one of the people who pointed this out and, and, Ed, and Edward Lorenz, who we'll get to, was, was aware of this work. But uh, I like this comment from, from Dyson that there was a change in the style of mathematics that has to do with what we are able to do to, to show something. The new mathematics is visual rather than analytical. And that's been a guiding theme 
throughout the history of, of uh, dynamical systems. Chaos theory flourished and became popular because computers were able to simulate motions accurately and display them dramatically. Um, so, so in this paper, they kind of do that for the system that uh, Cartwright and her colleague Littlewood uh, were studying, which was a lot like the uh, Lorenz attractor. It's actually a forced Van der Poel oscillator. So I, I was glad that this was there because it, it nicely uh, builds on what we've already looked at. So we, you know, start with the spring, then Hooke's law, we add damping, we add nonlinear damping, and we add input to make it a FitzHugh system. And now if we add forced period, uh, periodic input, you can get a chaotic system in certain regimes. So these, um, the top plots are, are just so, um, solutions for two out of the three dimensions. So you have to treat this cosine term as, as in fact, that T is explicitly there. You treat that as a third dimension. So that means that now you're in the domain where chaos is possible. So in addition to looking at the plots, there are qualitative ways of projecting down to simpler plots to get some sense of what's happening. And I get the impression that people are, there's a few sort of things that you can pull out of a toolbox, but uh, there's different things you can try. And it's, it, there's, uh, there's a lot of ways of analyzing a system. So what this is, is a Poincare section, which, which I'll get to, I don't know now, give me a sec. The, the, the second set of plots. So, so yes, this paper, I, if you like history of science, I highly recommend this uh, odd little paper. It's very funny. Um, so um, Cartwright and Littlewood had a collaboration. In fact, uh, they were kind of brought together by Hardy, whom some of you will have heard of. And uh, so apparently Littlewood would have this strange set of rules for collaboration. Uh, when one wrote to the other, it was completely indifferent whether what they wrote was right or wrong. When one received the letter from the other, he was under no obligation whatsoever to read it, let alone answer it. Uh, although it didn't really matter if they were both simultaneously thought about the same detail, still it was preferable that they should not do so. And it was quite indifferent if one of them had not contributed the least bit to the contents of a paper under their common name. I love finding these kinds of quirky <laughs> details. But uh, more to the point, um, and this is what I was saying about how when you were talking about celestial mechanics, people were only interested in conservative systems. And then by the time you get these um, nonlinear oscillators, things start to change. And in, in, in their case, uh, the government, this was in the build up to the Second World War. There were there was open papers kind of say, open um, invitations from the government saying, please help us uh, solve these equations that have to do with uh, radio. And uh, so they did something, but apparently it wasn't particularly useful. <laughs> uh, so, the, so the memo that was from the government was saying, well, we should try and get a mathematician's bird's eye perspective on these phenomena so as to not to waste time and energy in pursuit of a will-o'-the-wisp. <laughs> but Cartwright herself says that, uh, I do not think I have ever produced a result useful for any specific practical problem when it was needed. And I think, all of us computational and theoretical people can relate to that. Uh, um, okay, so we've beaten around all these different angles of things that are sort of leading up to the explosion of chaos theory. But what, what really kind of marks the, the dawn of this new era was this um, Lorenz paper from 62, I believe. And that's him. You always find these quotes uh, this one about the butterfly effect. So I'm guessing he thought about the butterfly by looking at the attractor. But this is the paper from 62, yeah. Um, and uh, what I like uh, about it is, so apparently for years in the 60s and I think early 70s, it got like one or two citations a year and because it was, people were not so interested in finding earth shattering facts in a meteorolog meteorological journal. But then once it broke out, then I think when James Gleek was writing his book, um, he was getting like 100 citations a year or something like that. So, so things really changed. What I like about it is how sort of nondescript it is. And then right at the end, the feasibility of very long range weather prediction is examined in the light of these results. It's one of those um, statements that 
where they, the person writing this is clearly aware that there's something important here. So if you looked at the um, Strogatz book or Wikipedia or any, any description of the Lorentz system, you know that it has something to do with the weather, but I actually find it quite difficult to link it with the, the observables. There's all these analogs and something about convection. And if anyone can, can make, make this clear, well, basically the idea is that you're studying convection rolls, which involve temperature gradients. And he looked at nonlinear temperature gradients. But beyond that, how exactly the equations relate to that is a little bit um, tricky. And even Strogatz decides to use a mechanical analog that Lorenz and some colleagues made instead of talk about what Lorenz himself did, which he didn't sort of pull these equations out of the hat. There was these, uh, a set of equations partly informed by fluid mechanics that other people were all already working on, which he simplified. So this is the uh, analog system that Strogatz talks about, which they actually built, where you have uh, this sort of Ferris wheel kind of thing with water or some liquid being uh, sprayed in from the top. And uh, what you would expect is that once there's a little bit of an initial symmetry breaking, it will go in one direction. But depending on, and if you keep changing the flow rate, what happens is it does go faster and faster, but eventually it will reverse its direction and then it'll have this chaotic back and forth of quasi-periodic behavior going one way and then going the other way. And so this is governed by the exact same equations as, uh, as the, these are the, the three deceptively simple looking um, equations that uh, Lorenz used. And here are um, some numerical solutions. So there's not a whole lot you can do closed form, but you can calculate the fixed points. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. And we see the uh, first version of uh, one of those iconic uh, images of 20th century science. So what's happening here? So there are three dimensions. So you can't really see the phase plane clearly in any two dimensions, but there are, so C and C dash are the two fixed points you can calculate. And for a certain value of which, r, this constant r here that governs y dot, you go from, so there's a steady state, then there's a steady periodic behavior with some multiplicity of period, and then you get a chaotic behavior. And what, what happens is the system circles around one of these fixed points and then flips over to this other half, circles around it for an unpredictable amount of um, time and then flip back. So that, that's what the Lorenz attractor is. Because systems that if you start the system way off or somewhere else in this parameter range, it will sort of pull itself in, into this zone and then it will be trapped here, uh, but it will never retrace its steps. It will always do something new in that finite space. I just, uh, I wanted to mention actually uh one really cute anecdote from uh, the chaos book about weather prediction. So apparently uh, our boy, Johnny von Neumann. Uh, so, so one of the things that he really wanted to do with, uh, I mean, he'd created this computer and you know, you could do, you know, uh, crazy calculations with it. Uh, and so he, he actually got a DARPA grant from the government to try and, uh, or whose goal was to uh, influence the weather. And, oh, yeah. and the whole idea behind this was if you put enough sensors everywhere, like an atmosphere and everything, then you could approximately construct like the dynamical system of the weather. And you could find these sort of unstable points where if you found these unstable points, then you would know that you could perturb it very slightly and have huge effects and be able to, let's say, uh, uh, find an area that had drought and just make it rain on command. So, uh, so that by was. The way, people, by the way, what he had as a clever idea is what many people want to do now for climate change. So, yeah. <laughs> I will say, as a physicist, that this is there's a long standing tradition of these like bogus grant applications just to convince <laughs> the military guys to give us some money for something cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, von Neumann really believed in this. 
And I think, I'm not sure if it was Lorenz directly, but uh, it, it might have been actually. But uh, um, I don't think it would have been Lorenz there because one of them died before then. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In the 60s, um, I guess. Huh? Yeah, I just know that the... Right before the 60s, actually. Uh-huh, I see. I, I just know that the argument was sort of... Uh, 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 was was put forth that this couldn't work because, you know, even if you had everything, uh, even if you had like a really good approximation of the dynamical system of weather, uh, you, you know, you, you wouldn't know what any one little perturbation would do because uh, it's it's essentially a chaotic system. I like so if you Lorenz's were... comment on this. He's like, yes, you will perturb the system and it may even have the effect that you thought it would, but you won't have any counterfactual because you won't know what would have happened uh, in yeah. the other uh, case, which I think is a very nice way of thinking about this. That sure, you, it's not like you can't push a system in, in some direction. It's just that you don't necessarily know what would have happened otherwise. I still love von Neumann for uh, for convincing the government to give him money for this. Yeah, there was it was I think it's in that book that it was saying that fifties and sixties marked a really really high point in uh, optimism about weather prediction and control. So this is the attractor in nice colors, not much easier to see. It's immensely fascinating you could just spend hours like if you if you simulated it i just got it working myself and there's so much you can try out it's, it's quite satisfying to play with it what do the two colors indicate here uh i think they're just uh, time so probably first half and second half of the simulation but yeah the fact that and i think the fact that it's red and blue on in both sides is to show that it does actually sw switch from one to the other. It's not like it was on one one half first and then on the other. So, so Lorenz showed that it has all these wild properties. At this time, the, the term strange attractor didn't exist yet. I forget who coined it, but that stuff that you'll, you'll find it's it. It's David Rule and uh, it's David Rule and Flores Takens. Yes, okay. So what's really cool about the 62 paper, it's quite readable, uh, is that um, he uh, invented sort of new ways of looking at, at uh, the system in, in dimensions where you can kind of get a sense of what's happening. And uh, this will kind of allow us to go toward discrete dynamical systems, which is the second half of the Strogatz book. So he looked at the Z parameter, the third of the dimensions, which is um, sort of the most stationary, like when, when things are going crazy in X and Y, Z is sort of oscillating at roughly um, a, a steady period, not exactly, but pretty, pretty steady. Um, and so, you, so what it is, let me just look at the peak value of Z um, over time. So now we're moving from a continuous system where there are values at every um, possible point in time. And we're now looking at a discrete subset, which is marked by these peaks. And what you can do is plot the value at some point in that peak, in uh, the, this peak value, and also plot on the y-axis the next value. And it has this characteristic shape. It's not a perfect shape. It doesn't, it's not governed by some function, but it gives you a sense of what's going on in the system. And for that, we'll kind of move to other discrete systems to kind of get to get a feel for this style of analysis. And so they're called discrete maps. They are a discrete dynamical system. It's just another term for a system where we're not using differential equations anymore. Now we have time moves in discrete units, but the, the variable x can still take real values and, and the parameters too. So what you have is example not like one. they can they will they should they should yeah. they, they I was can. actually they wondering are there values. is it possible to have chaos in doubly discrete systems or like rational systems 
rational systems maybe not but doubly discrete yes you can have doubly discrete i mean i mean 2d 2d yeah, I, I i didn't actually google too much x and y the x and y are changing is that what you are asking yeah well, multiple well, variables and you can have chaos so basically what? where um, the uh, well it doesn't but 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 yeah but basically we here the x values can take real values what if that was only allowed to take integer values or something but uh, can you ask my the axes a little bit more detail johan for these yes graphs? yeah i'll just work through this so we're just plotting where in in this case it it could be anything this is just an abstract system for now and it's marked by uh what what the value is it could be as we'll see something like population in this year and then this could be population in next the following year so what you can do to see where the system is going is say in the year 0 this was where i was now the function is defined by this curve so in order to get the next value all i have to do is draw a straight line up to where i hit that curve because that's what what the function that's what a function does right but now where do, what do i do next uh since it's a discrete system i know that now now i'm using this as my input so all i got to do is draw a horizontal line that hits the xn plus 1 is equal to xn so it's an iterative way to just work through where the system goes you just bounce along up and left or right depending on where the function is so this is just the the algorithm basically for how you do that and in such in some systems like this x n plus 1 is cos x n you'll find that it will reach a stable attractor you have to do some analysis to check if it's stable but but that kind of thing is the discrete version is not that different from what what we've done conceptually it's straightforward so so that's a discrete map now where things <laughs> when i was looking for pictures i found these you know sort of slightly corny uh quotes from people <laughs> like motivational posters or something or it's quite funny that this was the quote next to robert may's picture we share half our genes with banana but it's sort of weirdly appropriate for someone interested in chaotic dynamics right because it's like <laughs> there's clearly more to a system than <laughs> initial conditions of this sort um anyway So here's a, a an iterative map called a logistic map and the motivation and Robert May and I think 76 published a paper he uh, was not a physicist or a, or a meteorologist he was a, um, working in biology and he introduced this as a way to show that you can get really really complicated dynamics from a really simple system so we already looked at continuous versions of population dynamics so this is like i said imagine if you're looking at population in one year as a function of the population in the previous year and the motivation here is something like uh, if you were to cover up this 1 minus x part you you say that yes population tends to grow based on what the population was last year but then you reach some kind of carrying capacity or limit on resources um and then uh, the population starts to be pulled back down it's a really really simple system um in terms of the logic of what this is and when you plot that here you um you get this uh, parabola and what does it do and before so johan goes uh, into the simulations if it's xn plus 1 the next iterate is equal to the that equation that that's there rxn times 1 when instead if it was a continuous system let's say that it's not rxn plus 1 but it's dx dt is changing as this function on the right uh would you expect the behavior to be the same as the one that johan is going to show in the sense that is the continuous version going to behave as similar to a map that you see over here they are the same curves the dxtt is already forming the same curve the or the null line for the continuous system is the same as the uh the iterate function in the map do you think it will behave the same way if you were to do an integration or just solve it by euler's method what do you think the outcome would of the system would be if we were to assume this population growth is continuous rather than this discrete time case
you already made some claims about one dimensional and systems uh, as far as chaos and cycles are concerned but and so we know that there's some constraints and they have to do with this, the continuity idea that you, when you ca you can't have paths that intersect each other and go off in two directions but in discrete systems basically you can have states that skip over like uh, they don't pass through the middle so there's no inconsistency by when you jump over something and that's roughly the the intuition you want to have so the, so the, we're going to vary this r parameter the growth rate and so you do see a fixed point for some values of r you see um so the, so the, these are just single points there's nothing in between so you see this is a a, a two-year cycle two time period here you see something that i think has four four, four it repeats four. four year cycle where you have four different population values basically and you can keep doing this so try different values and the justification of this is looking at the, the fixed points and stuff like that. Um, so you, if you plot, this is a, a, a bifurcation diagram, but now we're looking at the, um, in this case here, this is a fixed point. And these are sort of the two fixed points when I get a cycle, the two, the two values that it cycles between. And they get period doubling. So it goes from a two cycle to four values. It, it moves among these four values once I increase beyond this level. And I guess all of you know what's coming. <laughs> um, once you cross a particular value, uh, you get completely um, aperiodic. Um, uh, it's like bounded chaotic behavior. And that's what the, the cobweb plot, plot looks like. You have this sort of bouncing around rather than stabilization. And so I was very happy. I used to always be very confused uh, by this diagram. I didn't quite know what it was, but I s simulated it just now, actually. And uh, so, yeah, you as you increase that R value, you see period doubling, and then period doubling again. And then you see, what is all this? Basically, the system takes all sorts of values, not, not all values, but many values. And there isn't really a stable periodic um, behavior. What's really cool is that you recover periodic behavior later in these gaps in between, and then you see chaos again. And um, if you sort of zoom in, you get self-similarity. So there's fact. So the fractal concept comes in here. And uh, some of you may have heard of the Feigenbaum constant. So even though there's chaos, there's something that is emergent in this something something uh, really quite fascinating. So uh, Michel Feigenbaum looked at the uh, ratio of the uh, interval between each period doubling. Uh, so yeah, basically this the value for which the period doubling takes place, and you get this constant. It's a long as far as we know, non-terminating decimal number. And for a while he was trying to express it in terms of other things. Is it related to pi, is it E, something like that. It found nothing. So it's, uh, as far as anyone knows, a new fundamental constant. Um, the same convergence rate. And, and what's crazy about it is that it doesn't matter what the, the functional form of the map is, as long as it has that shape. So you can use um, a sign, a, a, Cosine? No, sine. Any, sine. Anything with a U, U, U anything up, with that unimodal upside down U like curve will guarantee you chaos for some parameter. Um, and in, so, one D, in one D. What else is uh, kind of interesting in the bifurcation diagram is that you get you initially have the period doublings where it goes sort of one, two, four, eight, uh, so on, then sort of becomes chaotic or or is. Uh, yeah, I, I guess the period sort of becomes chaotic. I mean, it's sort of, there, there is no periodicity. And then all of a sudden three pops up. Yeah, three will hop up and then five will hop up. And then and then five, five and you have all the primes and then all, all possible uh, uh, periods. You'll find uh, all possible periods. 
So, yeah. so, so there is an even more. And there's another similar one called Alpha that uh, they believe to be transcendental, but nobody is sure, and uh, there isn't then, any proof that they are irrational either. But they seem to be. People think they are. There is an even more profound uh, theorem in this, uh, based on these 1D maps, uh, which is that if you know at a minimum that a n number of periods are going to occur. Let's say that you're going to have uh, a system with period, uh, give me a number, something like, uh, say, let's say that you have a system which is going to have period um, five, um, 11. I'm just going to make, make, make up the case, it's 11. The system, there is a theorem which guarantees what are all the periods that this system could have. Like, at a minimum, if you're going to have What happened? Did Johan freeze? The weird ordering. <laughs> I think it's Johan for us. Oh, your Johan's computer crashed. He just messaged. Oh, really? Yeah, but uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, may, maybe Johan can join, but meanwhile, I'll just say whatever stupid stuff I need to say. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's actually even more profound theorem related to these one D discrete, not just 1D, any discrete map system, discrete dynamical system, which is that I can, we can not only tell you like when chaos will occur, we can also tell you what are all the different periods that can occur in a given system. So for example, uh, like let's say that I have a system where I'm guaranteed 11 cycles, like, you know, system has like 11 points or 11 fixed points before it goes back to the first point. So it's a period 11 cycle system. Then a very famous theorem which says that all, all the odd numbers after 11, so that is 13, 15, 17, 19, and then all the even numbers apart from that are all going to be cycles of that sort is always going to be present. That's the famous Sarkowski theorem that Ryan has been, uh, Ryan just mentioned. So there is an ordering of natural numbers that you can do. So that'll tell you that you know if you if you have a certain number of uh, cycles, you can tell what are all the different cycles that the system will have. For example, if you have a system with period three, which is kind of what uh, Charlie was mentioning, then you will have a system with all periods, uh, all the periods in the so it will be three, five, seven, uh, two thousand ninety-five cycles, two thousand. I can name a random number, natural number. Any random, any natural random number cycle will be present in your system, including two to the infinity or whatever infinite sequence being that as a natural number too. Uh, so it's a very profound theorem on discrete maps that uh, just knowing what is the low, uh, uh, the ordering and what uh, cycle or periods you're getting, you can tell what are all the other periods that you're you will definitely get in those systems. Uh, and on top of that, if we also know a very famous theorem, which is addendum to that, which is that not only with period three, you get all different periodic orbits and natural number orbits. If you have a, a, a discrete system with period three, you will also have chaos. So for example, I can define a system in such a way that I, it can never have period three, but it can have any other period. Then it, need, it will not have chaos or I can't guarantee chaos, but period three implies all periods are possible and also chaos. So it's a, it's a very profound and unsettling theorem actually. Uh, so anytime I find a system which has three values that it takes as fixed points, and that's the only cycle it's going to go, that's one of the cycles that you have found, then you can be assured for some parameter value of R, which is your bifurcation parameter, you're guaranteed to have chaos in your system. So you can have, uh a period of five, but not necessarily have a period of three? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Really? Yes. There is a specific ordering called the, the Sharkowski theorem, which has a particular ordering of the integers. It goes three, great, three ordered first, like let's say that ordered first three, greater than five, greater than seven, greater than like it goes on. Uh, it is uh, all the odd numbers, then 
two to the two times the odd numbers, then two square times all the odd numbers, then two cube times all the odd numbers. Finally, all powers of two, and finally one. But but why wouldn't the same thing hold for five? I.e., like if you had uh, uh, a cycle of period five, then you would have you know five, seven, exactly, whatever, including three. three. You won't have three. It'll have all periods except period three. And it won't be chaotic. It, is that what you're we saying? Can't, we can't, uh, there is no there is no way to show that it can be chaotic, but we know for sure that if it's period three, it is always going to be chaotic. Huh. So that's the thing that uh, Ryan brought up. It's the Sharkovsky theorem. And it seems strange to me that you could have, or that the same thing wouldn't just hold for five in the sense that, you know, if you have a, uh, a period of, of five, then you would ensure chaos. Uh, you won't. So you can't ensure chaos if it's period five. Is it uh, just because... I, I mean, is that proved or is it just well, people don't know how to prove it? For three, we know for sure. For five, we have no assurance. Oh, okay. So it we could be no the case. It could we be the no case, value. but somebody hasn't proved it yet, for example. So, so what we do is that you can't have it's to... A theorem. There's a theorem for five that uh, it's possible that you'll have a period of five, but not necessarily chaos. I guess you just need to construct an, yeah, an example or something. Map. As you sweep the parameter of the logistic map in the approach to chaos, you go through the sequence. Yeah, yeah. So I, I get that. I'm just confused as to why. So, so I get that uh, you're going to sweep through uh, the periods in that order, but I don't understand why if you, fi if you find such a map with a period of five, then it wouldn't necessarily imply the same thing that a period of three would imply. Well, there are maps with a period five, but no period three, right? It's just that if you have period three, then you have all periods. No, I think the question that uh, Charlie is asking is not about the periods of other periods existing or three not existing. He's asking like, why can't systems with period five not have chaos? Well, for some value of the logistic map for lambda slightly, you know, less than whatever the value for, not for, but whatever value, you know, at the onset of chaos, there is a region where it will have a period five, but no period three. Yeah. So all we can say is we can't make any people, we have not made any, um, uh, we have no way to know whether period five also implies, implies chaos. Mm -hmm. But we do know that period three implies all periods and also chaos. Mm -hmm. No, we know that period five does not imply chaos because there are with period five and no chaos. Oh yeah. yeah, that's true. That's that's actually the whole point, right? Like only with period three you have chaos. That's right. Right. I'm sorry. I think I understood the whole thing. Wrong, right, so, so, it's confusing. But, yeah. Right. So, so you're saying that you can you can uh, construct an example that is period five, but uh, changing yes. the bifurcation parameter won't lead to chaos. Yeah, as long as it's not going to have a period three. It will not have chaos. It will have all the other periods from five. In that in that specific ordering, it's called the Sharkovsky ordering, which is mostly, which is not mostly, which is all the odd numbers then followed by two times the odd numbers, then two square times the odd numbers, and two cube, so on and so on until all powers of two and then one. So in a case, in a sense, the the period doubling is actually the simplest version. They are the ones that you can easily get from any sort of maps. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the odd numbered cycles, which are much harder to actually think about. Uh, the logistic map is just one, which is the one which has everything, basically. So is it true that you need to go through chaos to get from one prime number to another? Prime number to another? No. Prime cycle to another prime cycle. No, that is not required. All you the, go through a sequence of, of ever increasing period doubling bifurcations. And then there is like a point where it changes. Like if you see the gaps in this drawing, that's intermittency. Yeah. This is this is where you're getting new odd periods. Right. And before that, that the sort of emergence of that odd period, you have a, a chaotic region. Well, you... I wouldn't say that it's chaotic. It just has a a lot of period doubling very quickly, or no. In fact, yeah, it goes well, all the way from 
wouldn't it? I mean, the, the limit as you approach that period three, your doublings would uh, go to infinity, right? Or it would be, you would no, approach no, no, no. like- period, period doubling is not uh, infinity. It is two to the infinity, that's it. But that, that's what I mean, that's what I mean. You, you already have two, to, you have from one to two to four, uh, up to two to the infinity already almost covered before you hit the first intermittency actually. First break that you see, before that you actually hit most of the in, 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 uh, whatever, in, two to the infinite cycle, they're just over a very small range. And then there is a break and then you will see the odd ones and whatever, not odd ones, six or whatever, and then you will see three. I don't know the order in which it works in the uh, uh, in the bifurcation map here. Uh, I can take a look, but uh, the idea is uh, the the period doubling ones are rather this, the easy ones to get in most maps, uh, but the, uh, the, and I don't have an issue when you talk about prime, uh, 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 number uh, periods because uh, all odd numbers are prime numbers apart from two. So once you have this ordering that Tchaikovsky has, it's guaranteed, depending on where you are, all the prime numbers below in that ordering will be guaranteed to have. Uh, Wait, what did you say? All odd numbers are prime numbers? No, I'm, no all, all prime numbers are odd numbers, right? So, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, he just apart from two. Sense. Apart from two. Okay. So, I said the opposite. Sorry. I, yeah. all, all odd numbers. Uh, all prime numbers are yeah. cool. so so yeah there's a lot of structure in this uh, to explore but yeah you, you you probably have to go through chaos to go from one prime to another right because it's period doubling otherwise that, that was uh, yeah that, that, that was my point oh i don't think how else could you do it <laughs> what, what do you mean you have to go through chaos I'm, I'm meaning that if you're going through the bifurcation diagram you can't go from three to 17 right it, it has to, like it because it can only double no, you're, 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 why, why should it only double? Because that's what the bifurcation does. It does only, does. It, it does only double. No, no you're, actually seeing, well, you're actually seeing the bifurcations in this, in the sequence. There's the period doubling bifurcation, and then there's what's called the limit bifurcation. Limit bifurcation, you have both. Oh, okay. The so limit bifurcation, from one, that's not like chaos. Oh. But that's where so, you so, get a new odd cycle afterwards. So, so where is the chaos in, uh, like, so for Where's example, the parameter chaos, range for chaos? And, I'll give you one parameter where you will have the chaos of, uh, across the entire real line. When R is exactly equal to four, which is the highest value that R can take in this, which is the extreme end here. Okay, extreme right end here. That R oh, equals that four, big gap. Doesn't that have a period three? I'm looking the at the big gap is essentially period three. The big gap is where period three is found. Yeah, yeah. But uh, when R is four, that is again chaos. There you're actually going through the entire real line. You know, it hit every point on the real line. That is it's full chaos right there. Right. So what, what, how do you define chaos in this picture? Right? What and do you mean by chaos in this picture? The, uh, the chaos in this picture, uh, the, the, it's harder to say in this picture essentially, but chaos means, uh, if you go back to the previous, slide, previous two slides, Johan. No, but I, I really, I, I want to stick to this picture here. Here, no, no, I'll just like, get, I'll get, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Oh, Let I'm me, can I, can I try to uh, give like a quick, like a second description of uh, how you get this bifurcation map? It's, uh, so you take your discrete, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, you take your uh, discrete map and you, uh, you pick some R value, some parameter. Where, where's the actual equation that generates this uh, map? Do you have it on the? It's the logistics. It's just the logistic one. Okay, sure. Right there. Th th there it is, exactly. So uh, what you do is you, uh, so you pick some parameter for R and then you put in some initial value for X and then you just let it run sort of endlessly and it's going to converge to some kind of limiting behavior. And the limiting behavior for like small values of R is just going to be a fixed point. It's just going to converge to just one value. And that's sort of that, that initial branch of the bifurcation uh, diagram. It's just sort of a line. And then when it splits into two, what that is, is you're sort of uh, dialing up R. And then after you, as you dial R past a certain point, the behavior you get is no longer a single fixed point, but rather 
ex exactly, it converges to this oscillation where it bounces between two, two points. And then as you dial it up further, both of those two points themselves split into two more points. So that, that gives you four points. And then you just do this process over and over again, and you get like a stupid amount of, or a, a huge period cycle. And then all of a sudden you get a period three cycle. Does that kind of? Yep, that's fine. So I'll answer what uh, the question that uh, Ram asked, uh, which is that here the chaos essentially means this. If you go back to the previous slide, uh, uh, Johan, sorry. The one with, yeah, so here, you know, the one after, it, just showing all the uh, different cases. Next one. Different peak values. Yeah, there are different peak values. Just, yeah, just yeah, this one, stay, stay here. Yeah. yeah, stay here. So if you, so for all the period, you understand what period two and period four here is, right? Yeah. So period three will have three peaks of three different values before it will repeat again. Okay. Right. And then period tell. eight will have eight different values before it repeats again. Eight, eight maximum minimum. Right. Yeah, eight minimum or max, eight different values before it will form the same pattern again and again. Okay. Right. Yeah. After that, so when it is in a chaotic regime, what it has is you can never return to any single value. It will not have any integer cycles, basically. It can be, it, it is not going to fit an eight cycle. It's not going to fit a 10 cycle. Uh, it's not going to fit a 50 cycle. It's not going to, whatever number that you want in, as, an, as a cycle period number, the patterns that you're looking at are, are not going to repeat. Instead, whatever range of interval that they are in, they're going to pretty much take all the values in that interval. And they won't repeat. And the reason it looks a bit spotty is because you have to eventually just give up and stop simulating. This, is, this itself took a while to, to, meaning a few, uh, 30, 40 seconds or something like that, but or longer than that. But the, the, the gaps here are just that it didn't reach there yet, but it could have. So if you look at this figure at the very end at R equal to four, which is the extreme end, I mean, we have not done it fully. What you will see is that wherever I start as initial value, it will go through the entire real line, zero to yes. one. It will take all, it will hit all values between zero and one. And we know that a real line, zero to one is infinite uncountable and all right. that stuff. So, so that's exactly what will happen at R equal to four. But you'll see the same kind of pattern for even uh, before that, that is the chaotic uh, re regimes before that, but their, their range is not going to be from zero to one. It will be constrained by the max and min value depending on what your R is. So, it, but it'll be between that interval, within that, whatever that interval is, it'll span all those values. Right. Okay. There's this Veritasium Veritasi video about, about this diagram, basically. It explains it pretty well. It's on YouTube. Highly recommend it. Um, so just to sort of close the loop, uh, you might wonder what all this is cool math, but what does it have to do with anything? Um, there's a sense in which some maps of this type can be, can be pulled out of dynamical systems that do have something to do with the real world. Um, so we, we looked at this sort of briefly, but when you have complicated systems in multiple dimensions, one thing you can do is look at a projection of the system onto, uh, say imagine if this is something moving around in 3D. Poincare was aware with his powerful imagination that, well, I can't, but well, he couldn't plot it because the only, the only way he would be able to plot it is by hand. And he knew that for these chaotic three body um, movements, he wouldn't be able to. But what he imagined was a way of thinking about what if I place a section like a slice through the state space and then look at the discrete points when the system passes through it. Imagine like a, like a piece of cardboard that, and a thread sort of poking through it, thread in a needle. And you can um, start with some expectations about what you would see. So if this cycle here turns out to be periodic so that after some Xn, uh, it comes back to, to where it was, 
what would you expect on the Poincare section? Regardless of, or, or let's, yeah, regardless of what the periodicity is, you could say, you can make some claim about what you would see on that, on the section. You would have a limited number of points if it was periodic. Yeah, but exactly. If it was not aperiodic, it would fill up the whole section, right? Or it would just be smooth in parts of the Something section. Something like that, yeah. So that, that's that's the, the thing. So here's a bunch of Poincare sections for that forced Van der Poel oscillator. The um, Cartwright and, and Littlewood were the ones who looked at this, but they didn't have access to computers. So they were able to talk about this uh, indirectly. And I think they even commented on the fact that Van der Poel heard something when he played something in this forced regime that sounded chaotic and they comment on that. So they were aware of the something that was, they did, I don't think it was called chaos at the time, but, but they had glimpsed it. But when you can run it in MATLAB, Python or whatever, you can see it's here, the Poincaré sections, um, you have to, you're basically choosing something in this case based on time, and which in this case is the third variable, the dummy variable in some sense, which is governing this um, forcing term. And so you're looking at where the other two variables are, x and uh, in this case, y and y dot, uh, when uh, that sort of returns to its cycle. So you can do a section in space where you're only looking at um, say x and y in an x, y, z coordinate system. So your section will always be one fewer dimensions than the number of dimensions you have. In this case, time is basically what you're using. Um, and so here, the system keeps returning to these one, two, three, four, five, probably this probably is a few, uh, yeah. So they, like you said, it keeps returning to these points. If you increase it further, you get back this here. And here's something which is treated as a hallmark of chaotic behavior, it's spread out but it's not filling the entire volume. It typically, compared to the uh, um, actual ambient space in which it lives, it's zero volume. And that's, that's a marker of the fact that it's an attractive space. And so I just did this from, for my simulations of the Lorenz attractor. So, so even though a lot of, like, a lot of people don't show the, punk, uh, the punk alley sections, but you can do them just fine. Lorenz found other ways of analyzing it. Here's um, a periodicity that just returns to these points. Then we pass through the uh, chaotic regime and you see this interesting structure. It's hard to say what exactly it means. It vary depending on the specific chaotic system. And then you again go back to a limited number of points on the other side of that bifurcation. So what Lorenz did, he also looked at a discrete map this was his map, where, which we, I briefly mentioned, where he looked at the peaks in the third coordinate. And now that we know how cobwebs work, if you just imagine that X, sorry, um, uh, the, the, the equals diagonal, you can use that to talk about how it bounces from one side to the other, because it's, well, you kind of have to imagine it, but you're going here and here and then bouncing and, and this, this peak, this scallop here is kind of a sign of uh, similar in a way to the logistic map that shows a kind of bouncing from one end of the, one arm of the attractor to the other. So there's a lot that you can do investigating the properties of these things and, and uh, there are other and, and types of analysis we can do. It's a huge, um, infinite, infinitely large space, I think, of possible things you can work with. So that's all I, and, and this um, is something that came up in this video, which I highly recommend. There's a lot of really fancy graphics up there now. And so this is what I was saying earlier that the statistics don't necessarily tell you anything because if you take these, so what they've done is they've taken uh, spheres and they placed them at various points uh, in the vicinity of the attractor. And they asked, how often uh, is it in these various points in the sphere? And then you can look at these histograms and if you were to just look at the histograms of occupancy, you would not be able to make any claim about where you are or the fact that it's chaotic even necessarily. So there's, so despite the fact that it's unpredictable, there, there are statistical regularities or invariants that, that uh, make things, uh, that, and that's related to this universality concept. So, and this uh, comes back to the question I started 
we started with, but here there are techniques. How do we tell if something is chaotic? I, I, I have only scratched the surface of this, but I was looking for a review paper and I didn't really find like one paper that talked about all the methods. Typically it was somebody saying, I have this method um, that you can use. And uh, but there's, in this case, since this was a neuro paper, this is the one I sent out. They were looking at the interspike intervals of sequences uh, in a spike train and showing that if they're um, purely stochastic that you would see one property and if they're not, you see this other one, which looks a little bit like the Lorentz map. I find all this, maybe I just haven't gone through it in enough detail, but it's all a bit sort of maybe. And, and I keep thinking, well, you almost want someone in the world of adversarial uh, networks to say that, okay, you have a test that you think is, is a, um, a chaotic system. I'm going to make a probability, a, a stochastic system that passes your test. Uh, I get the impression that it's probably very hard to um, distinguish the two. But, uh, but yeah, there's, this is a whole, there's, a, there's lots of different tests people can use. I like actually, they briefly mentioned it, but they didn't show how you would do it exactly. But the thing that made sense to me was that you explicitly try to look for bifurcations. And this, I think, so you might, in some kind of first pass zero order sense, think that if there's some stochasticity, it's a relatively constant and stationary sort of thing. Maybe that's an unjustified assumption, but you might initially think that. And then changing some control parameter, you would not necessarily expect some wildly different behavior to happen because of a gradual change. So I, I think that bifurcation, at least from, from my perspective, hunting for bifurcation-like behavior would be somewhat convincing that, not that the brain is chaotic, but that a chaotic model would help me describe some of the data. Yeah, that it would be an appropriate map for the territory. I have a question about the, the neuroscience of, of looking at discrete versus um, continuous systems. So if you have a given period of time, like 30 seconds, you might have a certain number of action potentials in that time, right? You could have five or you know 10 action potentials in that minute or whatever it is. Um, is that what makes it a discrete system, the fact that the, the number of action potentials is whole, it's got to be a whole number, a discrete number of action potentials. And do people model that as continuous and discrete? And does, does that choice have these kinds of consequences? Is that what's at, at hand here? Not really, because the, the hodgkin oxley model is continuous. The, um, the discreteness comes from your choice of how you want to analyze the data. You may be using some data collection system, which is just counting spikes um, at discrete points in time, typically as well. But you may have actually more smooth data, but it's always going to be discrete pieces of data. So it's a lot about your choice of how you want to model it. You can treat your model as interpolating in a smooth way among uh, discrete data points, or you could treat the data points as the only thing you're interested in, in the case of so you may just think I'm like a lot of people who model spikes using point process models, they treat it as a sort of instantaneous event. And they're mainly interested in the inter, inter event time intervals. So that's one way you can discretize. You can do something in this Lorentz system that's uh, like that, where you say, okay, now the system is in the right lobe. Now it's in the left lobe and you just sort of get the sequence a b that switches in time yeah. yeah and you can observe certain features like it's uh, quasi periodic which essentially means that it has a discrete fourier, fourier spectrum and that's like a you know one positive observable that you can make that it, it, if it were hard. random it would not have a discrete fourier spectrum in yeah. fact you can do it even with the logistic map too right like instead of saying uh, the same right lobe, left lobe, you can convert the idea that any anytime the value is less than 0 0.5, you will say it's left. Anytime it gets greater than 0 0.5, you will say right, where the x values that it takes. So you can actually create this left, right again, and you can convert it into a symbolic dynamic. And uh, again, as uh, Ryan said, you will, you will be able to observe that in certain regimes, they look 
quasi periodic in others they won't and that's another way to figure out whether you know it came out of a, a stochastic process or something which is kind of from a a, a, a random uh, distribution uh, but it's harder to distinguish once you you already hit the chaotic regime or any of that stuff because it's again it's not going to have this uh, kolmogorov complexity uh, uh, like the kolmogorov complexity would might look as if it's being generated by the entire sequence itself there is no single algorithm that can generate that string of left and right if you want uh, so yeah you can do something but i'm not sure how how helpful it is to test for chaos in our data um interesting is uh, th- that some people want to say that chaos is useful or they w- there's this proposal which relates to what Karthik mentioned symbolic dynamics and it's what Ryan was explaining where you completely discretize and say is it near attractor one and is it near attractor two and those sequences can i think the idea is that you can get them to work a little bit like how we imagine registers to work and and things in in computer so in fact i came across um Cosma Shalizi's blog and he was very irritated with the uh, opposition between dynamical systems theory and computation because from that perspective computation is a subset of dynamical systems theory which i sort of buy but i think in terms of what you actually do day to day if you're trying to build an algorithm it's a very different way of thinking than trying to work with a dynamical system but but uh, it's good to know that is some fairly abstract um dynamical system theory to do with what um both uh, Ryan and Karthik were talking about that blurs the difference in a way yeah i don't know we have to be very careful when we talk about uh, uh, anything like chaos if you want to include that in in a scientific theory of uh like how systems work it's one thing to say that you know a three body problem a three body problem has chaos but it's a different thing when you really want to solve the, the problem uh i mean i don't know i i'm i think it's very it's awesome and all that stuff but i don't know how useful it is as a scientific tool to analyze anything so this is the impression i i got but also that there are probably situations where the brain finds itself in a chaotic stage briefly but and that can be useful for avoiding some particular minimum and it may be that certain sequences of behaviors or exploratory sequences are, got, are the brain converging on a chaotic um, system i i guess this my, to something called self organized criticality my, i i had a more simple question which is in the um example of the discrete population the population would be here and then at the next iteration it would be lower because there's a certain number of organisms there right what are the counts that we would use in neuroscience for a discrete chaotic system what would we be counting the main thing is that you're counting it at discrete points in time the the uh, other variable can be continuous the the so it has to be continuous the other, other variable is continuous what you're doing is you're only taking discrete time interval measurements of it well the number of spikes is not continuous that's a count so that's why you can't use it you have to make a discrete you can't make a discrete count out of it discrete integer count out of it it's probably why they use interval interval here yeah you have to use something else uh, because you're sort of like looking at real values not not integer values uh, then it's not um, a discrete map unless you want to define any recurrence relation a fibonacci series then is a discrete map right so i can have a recurrence any recurrence relation in integers then becomes a, a recurrence map so it's not really but useful are there chaotic integer recurrence maps uh, yeah, yeah there are not, i'm not sure about chaotic integer recurrence map but there are some of them right those uh, the crazy ones that they have with the once you include it in the uh, the, the the complex plane the, these arithmetic dynamics people we recently read an article right they, they had all those things when they're looking for rational rules and look into that uh rational roots or something of uh, curves they find this bizarre behavior uh can you can you explain what the the you count know, you might find of, again uh in in neuroscience you would have number of intervals it, it's not that what what is the the count of things the measurement you... doesn't need to be discrete in fact for the, for the chaotic systems we've looked at they can't be discrete 
So it's only the time at which you take a measurement that is discrete. Um, I don't know about that. We should yeah. check. It's possible to have, I don't know. It, it, I'm, I will not be surprised if you can find chaotic systems over like uh, finite fields, for example. That's what I was asking about. So no, no, we can find that. We have those. We have that. I'm not denying that. That's what the arithmetic dynamics is. I'm saying if you don't, if you can't simply run it over all integers, it has to still be bounded. Right. So, I, so it could be that there's something uh, that is chaotic. Yeah, I think I think logistic map number. itself, logistic map itself. I think people use it over finite fields, but we have to look into the literature. Um, to see what the dynamics I are. Called, I think it's called arithmetic dynamics or something like that, the ones that work with finite fields. And uh, people have recently found some connection between them and the, the regular dynamical systems and all that stuff, but it's called arithmetic dynamics. I don't know much about it. It's a very different world from so, so Yeah, in principle, I suppose you could use number of voxels or something like that, right? Uh, that, are, that are active. And those but, would be yeah, I think it's... Be, it's you it explored a lot in like cryptography and stuff like that so that's like a good space to if you if you're looking at in in um um uh, finite field uh results over finite fields and i think that's a good place to look. interesting but we should also be careful what might look uh chaotic from the discrete time collection uh then uh, in the continuous domain, it might not actually be chaotic at all. It's just possible that you're going through that individual point. You've just measured it at the wrong time. So, uh, But as we've just said, there's no way of talking about whether something's chaotic unless you know what the generating uh, system is. So, yeah. so you could pick whatever you like, and then there may be a chaotic model in, in integers for that relevant kind of mechanism yeah i mean I, I think ryan is correct i don't like that's what i agree with him i don't know whether chaos can be applied to those integer like settings you can have dynamics but i don't know whether you can apply chaos there. but like imagine you're saying there was, like the cryptography people seem to have worked are they that. doing i mean I'm, even over finite fields i'm not sure whether they're actually dealing with the chaotic dynamics there. but we can look into that yeah they, they might have some really really strange cycles and all that stuff but i'm not sure whether they're doing um they have like the sort of uh, uh, inability to talk about uh, periods or the set is scrambled or whichever way you want to talk about. I'm not sure that uh, the arithmetic dynamics people, when I mean arithmetic dynamics, those who work with dynamics or finite fields and you know, integers are rational points. They have chaos. They might have chaos. And I, I don't know. I'm I, I'm more with Ryan there. Um, I'm not sure. Johan, in this figure, is this continuous or discrete? Is this continuous? What do you mean? Is what is what continuous? Uh, is it a continuous uh, chaotic system or is it a discrete? Neither, right? So this is data. <laughs> That's the problem. Well, uh, it says computer generated action potential spikes. In which case, uh, so that's a Hindmarsh, Hindmarsh Rose model, and that's a continuous chaotic model. Um, that uh, you know, it's three dimensional or something like that, and it's mainly for bursting, I think. But but yeah, so I'm sure that if you sit with whatever three or four dimensional neural model you're working with, you can fuss around until you get get it to be chaotic. So the point is that you work with something that you know is chaotic, and make a test that that seems to distinguish between that and a Poisson train or something like that. And uh, the fact that the, there is no lockdown kind of definitive say statement that such and such piece of data is chaotic tells you, I think, that that is a, is a mixed kind of uh, success of these methods. So it's, it's, it's an extreme version of what I was saying right at, right at the beginning of the dynamical systems thing, which is it doesn't necessarily uh, give you data fitting tools. I mean, you can with great effort and uh, fit things if you want using dynamical systems theory and specifically the chaotic sub subdomain, but it's more about keeping certain possibilities in mind when you're thinking about what the system can do. And then if you're designing a system to do to achieve something, there are things that you can pull out if you need to. That's how I see it. 
in fact, the, the, the best way to actually like not worry about chaos or stochasticity, which one is causing which, right? Is to actually, uh, you have to, you have to stay, stake your claim out and you, you should just say that there is nothing called a stochasticity in the world. <laughs> Everything is from some chaotic process that we can't fully enumerate, then we can go with that. And then we don't have to worry about distributions and all this stuff. Uh, in which case, there is another big problem that we have to deal with. All Sorry, we have to know is Karthik, then in that, if you say everything is chaotic system, you're just saying, since everything is also dynamic, all dynamic systems are chaotic. <laughs> in other words, you can have multiple values if they have... No, 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 I didn't say that. I, I just said that all, <laughs> all, all chaotic systems are dynamic. I just said all chaotic systems will be dynamic and all the chaos in the world is because of dynamics. And all yes. the seemingly stochastic aspects in the world are because of the fact that we are living in a chaotic system. Right. So then in that case, if you go back to the previous figure, R equals four is, or R greater than four is not the only point of chaos. I'm saying that whole system is, uh, is a no, chaotic. No, no, no. R greater than four is not, R greater than four, it will diverge. We are not, it's meaningless. It, the, that's what I was saying. You, on the one hand, when you're first starting, it's a linear system. There are no choices. At the other end, you have you know, I don't choices. think it's appropriate to use the term choice. No, the, the, no, I, I'm intentionally doing that. That mm -hmm. is because if when you're talking about behavioral modeling, you the bifurcation is like a decision. So you no, come to that point. Look at the behavior. Oh, I behavior. see what you mean. Okay. okay. Be behavior okay. is going from state A to state B. When you come to your bifurcation point, that is decision. You can go okay, to the left or to the right. In Such, the model. When you say decision, it's a you have a choice to go left or right. But so the first point is one choice. Anthropomorphize the model. That's the problem, right? Because it's the experimentalist changing parameters, right? If you make R, oh, no, it's not the experimentalist changing the system. No. Well, why do you say R... experimentalist changing? No, I'm 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 not even thinking about experiments. I, see, a system, a structure, function, and a process. I'm saying I as a, a being, if I'm looking at it myself, my behavior will have bifurcation points and I'm making a lot of decisions. But that's precisely what I'm saying is confusing the map with the territory. Hmm? It is only, bifurcations only exist in models. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, no model is one aspect of characterizing a system. See, a system has chemistry, mathematics, and physics, hardware implementation and process. Okay, so yeah, I look at the all three of them together as a systems engineer. This is, this is the really, really important point I'm trying to make. There is a difference between the system and the description. Yes, I'm saying so, so. Description is only one aspect. Looking at the system as a function, you you have representation of input, output, and an algorithm that relates it. That's only one view of the one view of the system. But the system itself, it has a hardware implementation. You have the algorithm and uh, but systems don't have implementations, right? They just models oh, have implementations. No systems uh, have. How the system works is that is how the algorithm, there is an algorithm running in my brain. Think of it right? this way. There is no algorithm running in electron, right? At least I hope nobody believes that. Do you believe that orbits are actually an algorithm? Orbits are algorithms. Well, orbits in space. <laughs> orbits in space. Orbit, you mean like, sun, like, the, Earth like the moon is not implementing moon, an algorithm. Around the sun no, is, yeah. an, is an algorithm. Yeah. Any time you write an equation, I'm saying it's an algorithm. I'm saying yeah, the opposite. The Every algorithm, the algorithm is a dynamic. I, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, it's dynamic. dynamic. It is dynamic. I'm not denying There's a dynamic. There's problem here. This is the same. So I think, I think, I think. So is the. I guess the question is: Do you need intelligent behavior to execute either decisions or algorithms or any kind of mathematic at all, or can it be done by inanimate objects? Like the sun and the moon. Yeah, I, I, I think I don't think we want to bring in intelligence and make it a, a, a more complicated. But, right? but, but, but definition, but, 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 but definition it's important. Is, when you say an algorithm, when you say an algorithm, it means right? it has been designed. You have to either tell me no. how it actually came into being on its own, as in it was self-assembled. Then yes. I agree with you that an algorithm is what is causing the sun to go, uh, the earth to go around the sun. If you can show the level of self-assembly, which you can't, I can assure you that, assure you, that you can't, uh, then you have no, uh, you cannot qualify your statement by saying that the orbiting of the earth around the sun is an algorithm. 
But this is okay. actually exactly why no. I said all the things no, at it, the beginning of this session, yeah. which is if you believe that the universe is a computer, then all of this becomes meaningless, right? I'm because, not saying that at all. Yeah. I'm yeah. not, I'm just saying, yeah. okay, my definition of brain is a dynamic recursive self-organized ensemble of complementary systems. So, so, so something that competes and cooperates that is complementary and it is recursive and it is dy dynamic and it is self-organized. The memory is self-organized. So th this is my definition of brain. If you look at it that way, uh, then- So, but here's the question. Hmm? So here's the question. What is the difference between a model and of the brain and the brain? The, uh, the model is you are trying to understand how the brain works, it is, but your model may not have anything to do. Anybody drawing, uh, writing down a neural network, they claim it is brain-like, but unless you show that it, this is the same algorithm that is running in my brain, it is just a mathematical model. It has my point is, to do with is real to life. say that it is impossible to say that a, a model is the same as what is running in, the, in anything. Yeah, so it's it, always going to be because of pragmatic considerations, right? So there's this whole underdetermination of theory by experiment, right? Which right. means that you can, uh, you know, the number of data points you collect for any phenomenon is finite. And there's always infinitely many ways you can connect them. And the way that we do it is we have some loose notion of Occam's razor combined with some aesthetic ideas about which laws we like and which ones we don't, uh, and which ones are pragmatically useful for manipulating systems. The, uh, the jump from there to um, saying, it's particularly difficult when you, and it's a brain, right? To say, ah, I am this, when I say that the, the um, I, like I am, which is why even earlier when I was talking about bifurcations, the, this issue comes up, right? Which is if the whole system is, a dynamical system, then you can't say that one part of the brain is causing a bifurcation in another part of the brain. So there's a sort of ad hoc kind of splitting of one system into many, which I actually think is unavoidable, but for in practice, if you're interested in a subsystem, that's fine. Right. If I want to say that medial septum causes a bifurcation in the hippocampus, there is a instrumental and pragmatic way I can cash that out. It means that I have a model where if such and such happens, then I will see such and such in my deterministic model of the septum and hippocampus. But beyond that, uh, to say that there are bifurcations happening in the whole brain, then you have to start to say, well, uh, you have to add all these ad hoc parameter things like the world is the thing changing the parameters of the, which is okay, I guess, but it's no longer something that you can necessarily uh, make a model of. Yeah, that, that's why I said, if before I can say what is brain, I really need to define what am I. And so that's where I started, what am I discussion with you? I'm saying, I am body and mind in this world at this instant. So you have to start there and then say, what is brain? Why is, how does brain make me who, or, or, what I am? Or conversely, what I am, it led to the evolution of the brain. It's kind of a catch 22 and you have to do both. Yeah, that's that's how I approach. So what does what does the brain have to do with with the with dynamical systems and chaos? Brain is a dynamical system. Sure, uh, but I'm why saying, does the discussion of why does the discussion of dynamical system need to invoke brain? Because we're I, I'm trying to model brain. I'm trying to create a a, a, a structural model of brain. I mean, not structural. I mean, I'm the systems model of a brain consisting of structure, function, and process. I'm trying to define all three of them and say brain is a system. And dynamics naturally comes out of it because brain is constantly. But this is why like I, I the, the word dynamics becomes, we shouldn't use dynamics too much like a descriptor because everything changes in time, right? So it becomes like not a very descriptive term, um, which is why if you're talking about it, like, even an inanimate object is changing in time, right? It's like a rock is gradually losing atoms uh, yeah. <laughs> to the, so, so that's why saying what tool you're using and describing the tool uh, is, is the safe thing to do, right? And, and then say, okay, if, like if it were the case, okay, that you had a model of the brain, which was so accurate that every time you do something in the model, something like that definitely happens in the brain and vice versa, right? Then I can be like, okay, fine. The brain is a dynamical system. That specific one that you made, right? 
<laughs> but otherwise, I, I feel like it's premature to say this is that, you know, because like dynamical, if it just means changing in time, everything changes in time. Yeah. It doesn't it space our time. Yeah. Well, it has to change in time if it changes in space too, right? Well, is it? Okay. We won't argue. Yeah. yeah. We won't argue that. Let it go. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Which is why, uh, but yeah, so uh, that, that, that's exactly that's why the question I, I had about we had chaos in particular. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I find definition of chaos very confusing. That let me put it this way. That's this exactly I, why I started with this particular right. thing, which is it has so, to be a property of the model. Any other use of the term chaos will only confuse people. Um, and the same way that that ideally you want random uh, to be used in the context where we're talking about random sampling. We had this conversation once in grad school uh, <laughs> where everybody had some vague notion of what um, randomness was and some people thought it had to be a uniform distribution or something like that. And, and Imanju <laughs> managed to convince all of us that it's basically about sampling, whichever the distribution is. And, and that's where this algorithmic kind of thing comes in because you're mm -hmm. uh, pulling out of or from whatever it is that's that is allowed to be in your symbol set is, is randomness. Okay. Yeah, so you're focusing chaos from mathematical point of view and I'm looking at it from physics or behavior. There is point no other view. point of view. It's, it's a mathematical concept, but there was no concept oh. <laughs> of chaos prior so to the, the so the, okay. Meaning that it didn't come from Newton or, or you know, a, a physicist, like it's not really a physics concept. So, but okay, so, so yeah, I, I was thinking that we'll, from here we can like, like I said, pivot to information theory as via fractals and self-similarity and scaling and things like that. But I think I need two weeks to, to like read up on that. So if anyone has something that they would like to talk about next week, uh, I, I'm happy if, to have somebody like jump in and uh, present something or we can just meet in two weeks. Uh, and uh, talk about information theory. Does that sound okay? I wouldn't well, mind. You can email doing... me if you have an idea. Yeah, I wouldn't mind doing it uh, in two weeks. Okay. Information Just because, like, uh, I feel like people are pretty busy this time around the semester. And uh, maybe in the summer we can uh, uh, have it more regular or whatever. Yeah, and somewhere anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming by middle of May, uh, we'll get in the Grossberg book, which I want to read. Um, and, and that will, 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 I think, have plenty of opportunity for talking about everything. Uh, we'll have, like, I feel as though the Grossberg kind of thing is best way to talk about uh, perception and illusions and things like that, which is the, the and, and in, a, in a productive way uh, about consciousness, as opposed to what is awareness or whatever, because I, I don't think that is really ever going to be answered. <laughs> but once you posit that there is such a thing as awareness, we can make some, uh, <laughs> we can make some claims about, about <laughs> what the brain is doing. I think it'll be really interesting if the dynamical systems approach has any light to shed on those perception um, views if they, if they, if they go together. But I have a question. Why did they turn towards information theory? I was, I was having a conversation on, on Twitter, actually, and Mac was like, yeah, we should talk about this. But but not because I have suddenly decided I like information theory. It's because it gets used a lot. And there's some conceptual stuff that's interesting and stuff that I don't always understand completely. So it's more like just um, I feel like we don't really need to go that much more, more of Strogat. So I'll pull out a little bit of stuff about fractals maybe. So we're more or less done with this dynamical systems in neuroscience thing that we've been doing since January. Um, and from here on, it can be we'll general club or whatever. And once the Rosberg thing happens, we'll do that. Uh, and we can branch off and take breaks within that also. Um, but I think that that has covered so many topics that it'll be a bit, a bit like going through everything that you think the brain does to some extent. Uh, and and it, is, uh, it doesn't necessarily always use the concept of attractors and stuff, but it's a, it's a differential equation based 
way of, of looking at things. So time and change are always central and uh, attractors are always lurking. But I thought just as like a one-off thing, let's go over uh, information theory. In fact, someone I, I know was asking, well, why logarithms? And I thought I can give you like a, a one sentence answer, but it's actually a really interesting answer. Like what is a logarithm? Why does it show up in these places to do with entropy, to do with scaling, to do with dimensions? And I have a vague idea in my head, but I want to make that more specific. Compressibility and uh, multiplicative gain, roughly. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so thinking about scale is, I think, a very, it's, it's, it's a kind of old school in one way, but now armed with this sort of relatively new tool of, of, of logarithms. So it's sort of classical in a way, but also leads to all this crazy stuff like fractals and, and whatever. And, and there's, a, there's a natural connection between that and uh, information theory. So. It would be really great to hear an expanded version of why logarithm. Um, that isn't two words. So that'd be really interesting. Right, <laughs> Thanks, right. Karthik, for your succinctness. Yeah, so I'll basically, I, what I want to do is uh, expand on what Karthik just said, because I think that's on the right track. And there's a couple of things that Manchu once told me, which again, again, I will work in. But uh, it also relates to a question that you can frame like this. Um, what, uh, what's the difference between the Gaussian and the log normal distribution? It's a similar question. Um, and and uh, what does it tell you about the phenomenon you're looking at if this is the particular type of mathematics you're using? Okay. Which logarithms are you talking about? Are you talking about like in the Shannon entropy? Yeah, in fact, uh, yes, the Shannon entropy logarithm, and also just what, how, why does it show up in in the original form of entropy? Like, so th there's a kind of like, what is it that logarithms capture in general, right? And so when there's there's a, there's a type of self similarity that a logarithm captures, and which uh, is made sort of more explicit in these sort of fancy ways of computing dimensions, right? Um, so I'm hoping I will in two weeks understand the Hausdorff dimension, which I find very hard to understand. But if well, not, we'll talk about box counting dimension, <laughs> um, which the logarithm just comes from the fact that the that the Boltzmann weight is an exponential. Well, that and the Stirling approximation. So there's another interesting thing that that shows up here, which is that the logarithm came via combinatorics also which I think is the right way to think even about that exponential in the Boltzmann distribution. So the combinatoric perspective and multiplication sit well together also. So there's a few pieces to put together. I mean, that you can piece it together with Wikipedia too. But I think that there is something to be looked at there. Because I think so, in fact, the, the, the specific uh, way it came up, someone was reading an early paper, I think, by E.P. Jaynes about, th about thermodynamics and information theory, uh, one of the fathers of subjective Bayesianism. But uh, they were, and then they were reading the Shannon paper. And Shannon, his justification for using the uh, P log uh, P formula was, well, it, it sounded a little hand wavy. He's like, well, we want. Oh, he has axioms. And yeah, I know. But, but, but his justification initially is we want when things add together, uh, when we add a bit. Uh, the number of things you can express goes up by a power, but we also want uh, the notion that uh, we've added something, so we want to use addition. So there's this there's this informal um, justification that he gives for why. No, oh, there's like the mathematical formula. axioms that all of that transfer translates into. Yes, but but he still you feels the need to use that. If you read the paper, he he feels the, the need to use these sort sort of uh, justifications that come from pragmatic use of some particular operation. The uh, so that so that's something worth looking into. Where does that come from, or is it is that all? Because it, it's some it can seem as though it's just some sort of ad hoc thing, but it isn't, right? <laughs> so as you said, there's an axiomatic reason for that. But so actually, my first research project that I ever wrote a paper about was about this question of like, how do you translate Shannon's axioms into some kind of like, sort of algebra, of probability distributions. Nice. And it works out very nicely where like the associativity axiom basically like is what fixes you into logarithms. 
Like imagine you have a variable that takes three, three values, A, B, or C. You first ask, is it A? And then say the answer is yes, okay, it's A. But if the answer is no, then you can ask, is it B? You know, that's one way of doing things. Or you can start at the beginning, you'd be like, is it B? And then you can ask, is it A? And so you can think of it as two different parenthesizations of this uh, expression. And oh, this again, an axiom is basically just that the entropy, which is your change in uncertainty upon making a measurement, is the same, whether you do it this way or this way, because in the end, you learn the same thing, right? You learn what the value of the variable is. Have you so, written this down? Can you send it to me? Is this some project you have? Uh, yeah, but it's probably not readable. I mean, this is just like, this is just Shannon's paper, what I'm saying. Yeah, I'll, I'll read the paper again anyway, but um, uh -huh. yeah, look, at, uh, but just, yeah, that plus fractals and what does, because people keep using information theory in your sense. So I always, my eyes glaze over every time I see all those logarithms. So I'd like to just make, at least make sure I understand what, what people are trying to say. Well, you don't need logarithms if you just work in exponentiated entropy. You know, like for instance, mutual information. People will often talk about the mutual information between spike trends. Mm. Um, and so what am I to info to, what is the take home message from such things, you know? Yeah. And, uh, straightforward answer, nothing, but. <laughs> no, I know what your answer is. Yeah. Nothing. I mean, the pro okay. there's a lot, all sorts of problems with these information theoretic measures. Like one of them is, is that you can't actually measure them right? Like there's no unbiased estimator for the entropy. So these are the kind of things we're talking about, right? It's not like I'm going to be singing the praises of information theory. I want to, to know it. To, to no, no, no. You should sing the praise of information theory exactly where it is amazing. Where it is awesome, yeah. It's awesome. stunning. In the yeah. field of computing and the way in which they defined it or in the field of communication where they've defined it, it is stunning. Mm -hmm. There is not, no, no second guess about it. It's, it's insane. It goes so far. Very well and, then, and then apply it to some speed because you have no clue as because you're, 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 you can't model anything, you can't think clearly, then just borrow easily and then screw up everything. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, I've been recording. Yeah, in physics, we have a similar problem where everyone is excited about like entanglement entropy and things that you can uh, derive thinking about entanglement entropy and how to compute it and so on. It's not an observable quantity of a system and most of the time it's just unphysical huh. so it's like information theory it's like we really want to understand what information is but it seems like we're not quite there well there you go uh, that's 